All right. So uh, where are we? We are doing 4.3 and 4.4 today. 4.1, as a reminder, we were looking at uh, finding extrema and concavity. Is that 4.1? Yeah. How did we do in 4.1 and 4.2? 4.1 and 4.2 kind of work with those together. 4.3, we're going to look at graphing some of this stuff. So it's been a while since you probably thought about vertical asymptotes and horizontal asymptotes. Uh, so let's start there. If f of x equals one over x minus a, if we do the limit as x approaches a from the positive side, of f of x, we're just barely above a, which is gonna make this positive infinity. And if we approach it from the negative side, we're gonna have negative infinity. These two together are what generate our vertical asymptotes. Which I'm going to call BA because that takes a long ass time to write. Then if we send it to infinity, of f of x, we get 0. And the same thing happens if we send it to negative infinity. So while here, I didn't make this clear, x equals a is a vertical asymptote. Here, y equals zero is a horizontal asymptote. H a. There we go. Now we got more people online and in person. Not as many as I'd hope, but a bunch of people dropped with the uh, drop date yesterday. I guess the second exam was, I don't know, rough. I haven't graded them yet, so I don't know how everybody did. We'll find out. So those are ways of looking at the vertical asymptotes. Uh, so let's do some like definition, a vertical asymptote. If X equals A is not in the domain of F and X, And the limit as x approaches a of f of x is plus or minus infinity, then x equals a is a vertical asymptote of f of x. Yes. 
f of x. Now, for example, for horizontal or horizontal asymptote, we had x going to zero, or the limit being zero. But that's not what it is in general. If the limit is uh, x approaches, oh, infinity, duh plus or minus infinity of f of x equals L, then y equals L is a horizontal asymptote. Right, right. You presumably have done this stuff, at least if you took college or pre-calculus A or college of algebra here. Uh, you did this, but without limits. We talked about doing all this stuff without limits. A uh, handy thing for vertical asymptotes. Bottom equals zero, top doesn't. We don't want zero over zero. Weird shit happens. We've seen that with Lobotol's rules. We get weird limits sometimes when we do Lobotol's rules on stuff with zero over zero. When everyone's done, I'll give you another three seconds to finish writing and then we'll uh, do an example. Yeah, f of x. Let's give an example. f of x equals, we'll do x squared over x minus 2 squared. And I'll give you the derivatives. f prime of x is negative 4x over x minus 2 cubed. And f double prime is 8 times x plus 1 over x minus two to the fourth. So we can see the domain has a restriction. The domain restriction, x cannot equal two. Where does f of x equal zero? Zero. It's just where the top equals zero. Remember, a fraction is only zero if the top is zero. x squared, we have a zero at x equals zero. So the origin, and that domain restriction gives us a vertical asymptote there. We have a vertical asymptote at x equals two. Now we have some information we can start drawing the graph with. Let's take a look at the derivatives, find where the extrema are, uh, stuff like that. 
Well, is there is there a horizontal asymptote? Let's find out. What happens as the limit as x goes to infinity of x squared over x minus 2 squared? Well, we can write this as we can factor out the bottom. Not factor out, but multiply out the bottom. And how did we deal with doing the limit here? The quick approach, not doing L'Hopital's rules. L'Hopital would work here, though. Anybody? I know you guys know this. I've seen you do it on the damn test. Multiply top and bottom by the reciprocal of the strongest power. Yeah, limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over 1 minus 4 over x plus 4 over x squared. As we apply the limit, 0, 0, and we get 1. So we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 1. All right, so f prime of x tells us our slopes around stuff. It also gives us our extrema. We said we want to see where f prime of x equals 0. We get x equals 0 is a critical point. And we already know x equals 2 is a critical point because it's the asymptote. So let's look at a sign chart for the slopes around that. We got 0, 2, and we're looking at f prime of x equals negative 4x over x minus 2 cubed. So we'll pick some test points, maybe, I don't know, negative 100, 1, and 100. That should be easy to see whether or not something's negative or positive. Here, for the negative 100, the top is positive. Negative 4 times negative 100 is a positive. The bottom is negative 100 minus 2 three times. So the overall region there is negative. If I plug in one, the top is negative. And one minus two is negative one. So we got three negatives because it's cubed. And this overall region is positive. And when we plug in 100, the top is negative, and the bottoms are all now all positives. So this region is negative. Since this was our first derivative, this is telling us that it's decreasing to 0. It's increasing from 0 to 2. And it's decreasing from 2 onward. All right. 
So would zero and two be considered relative relative maximum? Or no? It looks like it's going to be a relative minimum because the slope is going downward and then it goes up. We'll see in a second. We're going to graph it. We'll definitely see it by eye. Okay. Uh, the best way to check it is concavity. We're going to do that one next. So we're going to look at the second derivative. And here we have a zero at x equals negative one as the top. So that's a critical point. And again, x equals two. So we'll do the sign chart here. And again, we're looking at eight times x plus one over x minus two to the fourth. Check negative 100, zero this time makes it really easy. And 100. I guess I could have done zero. Uh, zero was one of the critical points last time. All right, let's look at our concavity. We stick in negative 100, the top is negative, and I've got a negative four times on the bottom. So that's a negative. If I stick in zero, I've got a positive on top, four negatives on bottom, which makes that region positive. And if I stick in 100, all of them are positive. So that's positive. So we got concave down here, concave up here, concave up here. All right. So concavity changed at x equals negative 1. x equals negative 1 is an inflection point. So it doesn't look like it was a max or a min. It's not either, it's an inflection point. Oh. Oh. Kind of like uh, x equals zero for x cubed. The slope changes. Yeah, the slope changed, but the concavity, we're, we're gonna graph it right now. Let's take a look at it. So we gotta put all this shit together. Let's lay down our asymptotes. We've got an asymptote for x equals two. X equals one was a vertical asymptote or horizontal asymptote. We saw that our zero was zero, zero. X equals zero only at the origin. And let's see, uh, from zero to two, we saw it was, it's deep, uh, let's put it on our in inflection point. Inflection point is at negative one. What is the value of negative one? f of negative 1 is negative 1 squared. Everything on this should be positive because f of x has got two squares, is square on top, square on bottom, over negative 1 minus 2 squared. This is 1 over 9. That's pretty, pretty close to 0, right? And we know as it goes to two from the left, it's increasing. So that should definitely be making a vertical asymptote upward there. 
and it's decreasing, so it's got to be coming down. And we had decreasing here. It's decreasing here, but the concavity changes here. So it's doing something like this. And then it, it wait, 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 no, horizontal asymptote. Concavity, it was concave down on the left, my bad. It's doing something like that. And then it bounces up that way. And it goes like that. So we had horizontal asymptote at negative infinity and positive infinity. Because it didn't matter which one we stick in here. If we do it at negative infinity, the same thing's going on. Still a horizontal asymptote at one. So let's see, make sure everything's matching. Uh, our derivative before zero is decreasing. It's going downhill. That works. From zero to two, it's increasing. And from two onward, it's decreasing. My concavity was downward from in negative infinity to negative one. That matches. And it's upward here and it's upward there everything's matching uh while you guys are writing that i'm gonna throw it in desmos and see what we get And if we come over and look at Desmos, kind of looks like what we got. I threw in the asymptote so you can see it. It is going to x equals one or y equals one on both sides. It does have it. It's hard to kind of hard to show that concavity between. It's only going down one from negative infinity all the way up to negative one. So here, notice it never crossed the asymptote, horizontal asymptote, going either direction. That's not always true. When Does anyone remember when it can cross the horizontal asymptote? Or how you find where it crosses the horizontal asymptote? Because it can. This is taking. This is way back in college algebra, pre-calc A. Uh, and for some of you, if you took it in high school, you may not have even covered it. The horizontal asymptote is where y equals a specific value. In this case, it was one, and y equals f of x. So. We can set f of x equal to that horizontal asymptote and solve for x. In this case, x squared over x minus 2 squared equals 1. Because that was our horizontal asymptote. Here we had x squared equals x minus 2 squared. And what do we get? So zero equals negative four X plus four. So 
So x equals one. Look at that. I did actually did have it cross the horizontal asymptote. I wasn't even thinking about it when I was so only looking at the infinities. I had it. We can find exactly where it crosses the horizontal asymptote when you set it like that, set it like that. All right, so general general steps. I'll let you guys finish writing that down if you want. Looks so bored, V. Boring. Tired. I'm with you on that. I did not want to get out of bed. But I do like teaching this class. I do enjoy it. All the stuff we're doing right now, especially what we're ever gonna do and with the extreme and stuff, this translates to multi-dimensional, like two-dimensional, three-dimensional. Uh, calculus three students are doing this right now, the exact same finding extrema, but on a two-dimensional surface. Uh, so this, this stuff scales up. You'll see when you get to calculus three. Does anyone need this up longer? Okay. So, graphing rational functions. We've got f of x over g of x. These are polynomials. Uh, with no common factors. Common factors, when they have a common factor in common, those give you the holes in the graph. Here, when we have a, like, it's going to make the bottom zero there. Bottom is zero there, but so is the top. Well, the top isn't necessarily zero, but bottom is zero, but it gets canceled out by the being a common factor on top and bottom. So it ends up being, it's a hole, not an asymptote. They're called removable discontinuities. That's some next level shit. You'll do that in another, another class. So step one, identify your asymptotes. We have vertical asymptote where g of x equals zero, the way I defined it up above. And then the whole, there's, there's options for horizontal. There are horizontal asymptotes. There are slant or oblique asymptotes. And then there's something called curvilinear. So for the next part, compare the degree of the bottom of the numerator and denominator, top and bottom. 
Let's say it's M and N. If M equals N, they're the same degree. This is where you have a horizontal asymptote. Horizontal asymptote is where the limit as X goes to infinity of F of X over G of X equals L. We have a horizontal as asymptote at Y equals L. Then we have our slant asymptotes, slant or oblique. This is where the top is one degree higher. So like M equals N plus one. And your slant asymptote will look like a line, y equals mx plus b. You'll be able to make a line for it. And then if it's larger, the top is two degrees higher or more. This is a curvy linear graph, or a curvy linear there. It's a weird word, curvy linear, and it's going to infinity. along a curve. And then it all just depends on the graph. The slant oblique asymptotes also go to infinity, but they follow a very, there's a, it follows a line. This is a long section. We're going to be doing 4.3 all damn day. All right, you guys ready to uh, give it a try? Oh, that's shit. That's not the end of the list. What am I doing? That's just that page. I ran out of paper. We got more on the list of shit to do. We haven't talked about everything else you need to grasp. Does anyone need this up longer? Okay. So that was just step one, finding the asymptotes. Step two. Uh, find your intercepts. Step three. 
I didn't do it in this last one because it was positive everywhere. We had squares on everything, but you generally want to do a sine chart for f of x. So you can see like what's above, what's below the above and below the x-axis. Everything was above the x-axis in the last problem, so I didn't make a sign chart. Step four. Now do a sign chart for f prime. to find the extrema. And intervals of increasing and decreasing. We little need a little bit more to find the extrema. The extrema, uh, finding concavity with a sign chart for the second derivative. This will tell us whether our critical points from four are, tells us inflection points or max or mins. I guess you could say step six is to put it all together and draw. I re recommend pencil for the first go around while you're putting it all together. used to be a pencil. Oh, there it is. I'm going to do pencil on this next one. And those of you that are ready to start, and I'll write this again on the next page, graph f of x equals x squared plus 3 over x. Now I'm going to give you several minutes. We take five or 10 minutes to try to do this. Talk amongst your, your neighbors.
Yeah. Uh, you could use Loki. Well, for infinity, infinity, I would use Lobital's rule. Because, like, when you're going, you're checking for a horizontal asymptote, you, it's there. It's infinity over infinity. Just use Lobital's rule. Same, same thing. Yeah, it's just whether or not Lobital's rule. Lobital has specific requirements. It has to be reproducing a zero over zero or an infinity over infinity or something like that. So when you're like doing X equals zero, it's clearly the, the vertical asymptote, but it doesn't make the top a zero. So we don't need to do Lobenthal's to check what's going on there. You can just, you can actually just be smart about it and write this as X plus three over X. And then you don't even need Lobenthal's rules. Yeah. That's why I get paid the big bucks. Lopital is only for evaluating limits. It's not for finding the derivative. That's a better answer to your question. Stop and thought about what you're asking.
right? You guys ready to take a look at it? People stop moving, working. So we got f of x equal x squared plus three over x, which is x plus three x to the negative one, or x plus three over x. We can see that we have a vertical asymptote at x equals zero. We can check for horizontal asymptotes. Limit as x goes to infinity. The top is one degree higher. So x plus three over x, this goes to zero. And so the horizontal or the oblique, it'll be an oblique or slant asymptote. Follows y equals x. Are there any zeros to this? Are there any x-intercepts or y-intercepts? There's no y-intercepts, right? Why? It's a vertical asymptote. X equals zero is the y-axis. It's a vertical asymptote. So there's definitely no uh, y-intercepts. What about x-intercepts? How do we find the x-intercepts? Set equals zero. Set equals zero. X-intercepts are when y equals zero. So f of x equals zero. So I've got x squared plus three over x equals zero can only be zero when the top equals zero. But it looks like we're going to get complex solutions there. So there are no real zeros either. All right, so f prime of x is... I think that one's the easiest one, or this one's the easiest to take the derivative of. We have one minus three X to the negative two, which is one minus three over X squared. And the second derivative is six X to the negative three or six over X cubed. This gives us our, help us get our regions of increasing and decreasing. Let's see, if I get a common denominator here, I have x squared minus three over x squared. And I wanna know where this equals zero. So we gotta, we gotta, we gotta check around our critical points are zero and plus or minus root three. X squared minus three equals zero, X squared equals zero, solving those. Square root of one and negative square root one is there, negative square root of four, Square root of four is there. 
So easy points to check are, let's see, let me block off our regions. Checking negative two, negative one, one, and two. In this. So f prime of x is x squared minus three over x squared. So if I stick in negative two, I've got four minus three, the top is positive. And the bottom is a negative times a negative. This region is positive. Uh, plugging in negative one, the top is now negative and the bottoms are still negative. So that gives us an overall region that's negative. We stick in one, we again have a negative on top and now the bottom's positive. So that's another negative region. And when we stick in two, the, everything's positive. So we have increasing, decreasing, decreasing, increasing. And since that's an asymptote, I'm guessing it's doing something like this. I'm guessing. Because increasing, decreasing, that does increasing, decreasing. This is decreasing, then increasing. So probably something like that. Yeah. Backtracking is essential if I fucked up. Vertical, the vertical The denominator, where is it equal zero? Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't write it, but the general way of doing it is set bottom equal to zero and solve. That one was like a freebie, but I guess it was so free that it wasn't clear. In fact, we, we can tell that this might do that. I don't know that I've lined it up right because we know that follows y equals x. So maybe it's these are our asymptotes. It might be doing something like that. Maybe I drew it wrong. Maybe that's not it. Maybe it's doing something like that. Increasing, decreasing, but let's do the second derivative and, oh, it did the second derivative. That gives us just zero. And increasing, decreasing, I'm guessing the net left is gonna be negative, so concave down. And the right is gonna be positive, so concave up. We're doing six over x cubed. So whatever sign we have is the sign of it. This is negative, this is positive. It is concave up and concave down, or concave down and concave up. So let's put that all together. I'm gonna check to see if it actually crosses that oblique asymptote anywhere by setting f of x equal to x. Let's check to see if it crosses the oblique. The oblique was y equals x, so we're gonna set f of x equal to that. So we have x squared plus three over x. And when I multiply, I clear the fractions, I got x squared equals x squared plus three. 
Zero equals three, so no, it doesn't. So we got a lot of info here to put in. Uh, I have a vertical asymptote for the y-axis. We have a oblique asymptote for y equals x. that the graph doesn't cross. We don't have any zeros, but we have critical points at plus or minus square root of three. Square root of three is like right there. It's closer to two than than one. And we know, so near the asymptote is a great way to see what's going on. Just to the left of the asymptote, it's decreasing, which means it's got to be going like this. Maybe I, I maybe I went too high because it looks like let's see that I didn't use a pencil like I said son of a bitch see this would have been better if I had a pencil then I wouldn't have had scribbles all over my shit and I'll just plan ahead oh, why am I using red red is my asymptotes. We got some here and it's decreasing as it comes away from the asymptote on the left. So probably something like that. And then we see that the slope is increasing as we come from the left and it's supposed to follow that asymptote. That follows. And we know it goes along this asymptote as it goes this way. Now it's probably a little bit higher it's the, the the dots are probably not that close to the asymptote. Uh, how could have I found that? Like, I don't know that I did a very good job plotting that. I should have done something different. We're going to do something different. We're going to fix this. I know this is a critical point, but all I did is found the X value. That's fucking stupid. Let's find the Y value. We had x squared plus three over x or x or x plus three over x. So this is square root of three plus three over square root of three. That's two root three. And if I do negative, I have negative square root of three plus three over negative square root of three. So that's negative two root three, which is about 3.5. Anybody got a calculator? About three point feels like it is. I think court square root of three is one point seven. Three point four something. All right, so let's let's reset this up. Cause my shit looks like trash right now. If I'd used pencil, I wouldn't need to grab another piece of paper. But that's why we use print pencil. Pro tip. MF. <laughs> All right, I'll turn it back on. I know you can't see. Thankfully, it wasn't Zoom that went off. Just uh... all right.
So we have a vertical asymptote. We have our x-axis. We have our what oblique asymptote. I need to give a little bit more this way. So we had about negative root three and then negative 3.5, which is about there. And then we had root three and plus 3.5 is about there. And we saw that was doing that and that was doing that following that asymptote. That's doing some shit like that. Let's see what it looks like on Desmos. There we go. It kind of locks on it. Oh, nice. That neat. That's neat. It clicks on it like I did the line and I dragged the dot and then it got there and it snapped on to the minimum. So we have a minimum here and it actually snapped onto the value here. And coming this way, it snaps onto the value there. So those are the points we had. And our graph looks like what we were saying. That's fun. Okay, so. Uh, a little bit more to add to this graphing. Shit, I got a lot of pages for this section. For that. Mm -hmm. it, uh, oh, let's take a break. You guys need a break? Let's take a break. I got All right, so uh, we can have little non-fun shit at x naught, even if it is continuous. If f is continuous at x naught, but f prime of x naught does not exist, then f has a vertical tangent line there. There's a couple possibilities. They kind of look the same. It can be doing some shit like this. Or some shit like this. It needs to be a little steeper there. This is where F prime is negative on this side and this side. And F prime is positive on this side and positive on this side. Then the scenarios where they don't line up 
if f prime is negative on the left and positive on the right, we're doing some shit like this. So we got an asymptote down the middle. Not asymptote, but a vertical tangent line. It does exist there, it crosses there, but it has a cusp. And our other cusp is gonna be pointing upward. So F prime is positive on the right or left and negative on the right. Why would I show you this? You'll see. Guess what this next problem is gonna have? Be one of these, right? I like nitrous oxide. That's good stuff. That dentist shit. Don't, don't, don't do this. But like when I was like a young, stupid teenager, I was into drugs, and every once in a while, someone would be able to get like a big ass, like get one of those, and we'd have like balloons of it, and you have a laughing gas, just enough to get a buzz. Not good. Not good. Don't do it. All right. Let's graph f of x equals x minus 2 to the 2 thirds power. Ooh. Does this have any vertical asymptotes? No, there's no denominator, right? So the domain is all real numbers. Uh, what's the range? Another way of looking at this is, this is the cube root of x minus two squared. Can I get a negative answer here? Why? If not, why? Come on, Easley, you're the one that shook your head now. You're right. Do you know why you're right? No. You can normally, can we have a negative outcome here? Can f of x be negative? The answer is no, but it's not because it becomes undefined. Because we can take the cube root of any number, positive or negative. This forces the inside to be positive. So the cube root of a positive is a positive. That's why. It's not that it'll go undefined or it's not like anything. I don't know if that's what you meant. So the range is actually gonna be zero to infinity. It can be zero if X equals two. Now we start looking at derivatives. Well, intercepts, we just said x equals two causes y to equal zero. 
So we have two zero as an intercept. And when x equals zero, what is y? P root of four? That's not fun. That's not fun at all. I don't know what that is. Ah. All right, so f prime of x, I think it's easier to go off that one. We got two thirds x minus two to the negative one third if we subtract a one. Then you take the derivative of the inside, don't forget the chain rule, but the derivative of the inside is just one here. I'm gonna write it, even though it doesn't change it, just as a reminder, you always take the derivative of the inside. So that's actually two over three times the cube root of x minus two. We actually have a critical point here. F prime of zero does not exist, or F prime of X does not exist when the denominator equals zero, when X equals two. So F of X exists there. We have a value, but the derivative doesn't exist. So this is one of those cases that we were just talking about. We're either going to have we're going to have a vertical tangent line in some way, shape, or form. Uh, let's do a sign chart to figure out what it is. I got zero on the left, four on the right. If I stick in zero, I get a negative sign, cube root of a negative two. If I stick in four, I get the cube root of positive two. So it's looking like that, which is going to mean a cusp. Our second derivative should confirm that. We should have concave down and concave up. Let's take a look. We bring the exponent down again. We've got negative 2 ninths x minus 2 to the negative 4 thirds. So negative 2 over 9 to the cube root of x minus 2 to the fourth power. We'll check our concavity, 0 and 4. Oh, it's not concave. It's concave down on both sides, isn't it? Negative over a positive. That matches that. This is concave down. That's concave down too. So we have a cusp there. And we know that is at two zero. And at Q root of four, I don't know what it is. That's where it crosses. Some shit like that. Since we didn't have a denominator, we didn't have any chance of a horizontal asymptote or anything like that. This is going to go to infinity as x goes up. Uh, it just starts going up, looks like slowly. 
we come over here to Desmos, plug this bad boy in. What do we have? Two thirds. Now y equals x minus two raised to the two thirds. That's the cube root of four, 1.587. And it slowly goes up the further it goes out, but it keeps going up. Fun. Yeah. So like for an example, we have to like actually like do like the exact answer for the cube root four or just can you just put No, I wouldn't require it. Now if you had more stuff to graph, like if we had like a others like you had a maximum somewhere else. You would want to know where cube root four is relative to that. But in this case, it was, I mean, you can always throw it in a calculator and get it. All right, one more for the road. Yeah. Row x equals 2 and x equals 0, were those variable points of the This is the x-intercept and y-intercept. So x is, x is equal to 2 is the x-intercept? So two, it generates 2-0. x equals 2 is actually a vertical line. Oh. Okay. The, the one makes it the y-intercept, or the x-intercept is y equals 0. The correct way about going about doing it is set this equal to zero and solve for x. So that's how you find the, the y-intercept. So you cube it, you get x minus two equals zero. So x equals two when y equals zero. Y-intercept means y equals zero. So was that the y-intercept or the x? -intercept? X, my bad, x. X-intercept means y equals zero. All right, thank you. Uh-huh. All right. Uh, here, try this one and... Oh, one and a half for the exponent here. Let's do four-thirds. Wrap this bad boy. This I can pause the recording. So finish this up. Try to graph this on your own. We're going to go over the solution to this on Tuesday morning before we start 4.4.
Other than that, have a good weekend. I am not going to be at the Mesa Center this weekend. Drugged up, you know. Going to try to give me some of that good, good shit, the narcotics. He's going to try to tell me to take ibuprofen. I'm going to be like, no prescription, please. Get the good stuff. Hopefully I don't need it. Hopefully ibuprofen does it. Did you get all drugged up, Matthew? Uh, they gave me amphetamine milligrams, but ibuprofen. And that, that was enough for me. Ibuprofen was enough? Yeah. Nice. I got codeine, though. I didn't, I didn't take it, though. All right. I will see you guys on Tuesday.